From ancient times, man has been obsessed with trying to tame time by tracking the heavenly bodies with man-made instruments and monuments, such as the case with Egyptian obelisks that have been used for symbolic meaning on a number of different levels and placed strategically throughout the world. This obelisk was placed here as a war memorial for Egyptians who died trying to annihilate Israel in 1948. The strange thing is that it has been set up in Israel rather than Egypt. It is next to the Ad Halom Bridge that was blown up by the Israelis as a way of saying to Egypt, thus far, the Egyptians could advance no further into Israel. The time is now to say Ad Halom, thus far, in order to stop the advancement of the Egyptian sun god worship that has become the false substitute for God's clock and calendar. Even if we have to blow up the pathway of paganism, that is advancing its agenda in our midst. Well, you all, I'm not in Egypt. I'm not in Rome. I'm not anywhere in the Middle East. I'm in New York City. Are you kidding me? The Egyptians being allowed to place an obelisk in Israel raises some serious questions. But why would America want to bring this ancient clock to its shores and place it here in New York City? The answer may be more troubling than some might want to admit, but time will tell. This obelisk, along with its twin in London, was built by Pharaoh Tutmos III in 1443 BC to celebrate his jubilee and was placed outside the Temple of Tum in Heliopolis, City of the Sun. This time frame and name of the temple coincide with the Israelites' stay in Egypt. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Pitom, House of Tum and Ramses, Exodus. 900 years later, the Persian conqueror Cambyses, son of Cyrus the Great, brought down both obelisks and set ancient Heliopolis ablaze. It took Augustus Caesar in 12 BC to find the obelisks and set them up in Alexandria, Egypt at the Caesarium in honor of his deified uncle and creator of the Julian calendar, Julius Caesar. Even though Augustus wanted to honor his uncle, the hieroglyphics on the sides of this obelisk give glory to Pharaoh Tutmos III and Ramses II, along with the sun god Ra and his divine son Horus. There's much more than I have time or the stomach to explain. Just trust me on this one. It gets much worse. This obelisk stood the entire time in Alexandria, Egypt until 1880, when it began its long trek to this very spot in Central Park. Approximately three months before its arrival, it was reported that 9,000 Freemasons paraded up Fifth Avenue for a solemn assembly and to conduct a pagan ritual to dedicate the cornerstone upon which the obelisk presently stands. The October 10, 1880 edition of the New York Times newspaper reported the following statement by the Grand Master of the New York Chapter of Masons, Jesse B. Anthony. Quote, The investigations of astronomers have demonstrated the fact that the Great Pyramid was designed as an astronomical stone clock or ancient observatory erected by inspiration of the Most High, for it cannot be attributed to accident that at exact periods of time of long intervals, between a thousand years and over a certain star, the timekeeper of the ancients is in such a position to shine down upon the entrance passage of the Great Pyramid." Unquote. You can't make this stuff up. The new obelisk was the Masons' connection to the timekeeping, sun god worshiping, ancient Egyptian pagan religious culture, and reportedly thousands of New Yorkers were there to provide their nod of public approval. Or maybe they had no idea why they were there, and they just liked parades. Under the ancient obelisk, there was what looked like crab claws that just gave me an unsettled feeling. Maybe it might seem like an overreaction, but I had to do what I've been doing thus far in the Time Will Tell project. I needed to take a closer look. I wondered if they had any significance or if they were simply used for artistic purposes. As I walked around the obelisk, I noticed something very interesting. It was as if the crabs were holding up the damaged base of the obelisk. As I got closer, I noticed that all of the crab claws had an English inscription engraved on it that told the story about the obelisk and its journey to Central Park. I thought that was a very nice artistic effect. And it relieved my concerns until I reached the very last claw and noticed that the writing was in Latin and ancient Greek. You know that unsettled feeling I had? Well, it came back with a vengeance, and for good reason. As I stepped away for a little perspective, I noticed this lady painting my obelisk and she looked to be taking it very serious. I just couldn't resist this teaching moment 
to help her understand that this was not just an object for art, but rather it was an ancient Egyptian sundial that is rooted in pagan worship of a false deity named Ra. So I engaged her by asking her why she picked the obelisk to paint, and as they say, the rest is history. Well, I'm doing this now. There's actually going to be three different views, and it's going to come together and make an obelisk, mm -hmm. uh, like a, a painting that's a sculpture in a triangle format, because there's three different sides. This is one of them. <clears throat> but I'm doing it right now because this is basically uh, a time where uh, we just had a solar eclipse, which, um, well, this obelisk is a symbol of the sun. You know, it's, it's dedicated to the god Ra. So in honor of that, I decided to do this uh, painting, triptych, actually. There you have it, right out of the mouth of a confident, no-holds-barred, real-life person and not some ancient Egyptian who's far removed from our present day reality. Her confidence about honoring the sun god Ra really fired me up. I serve the one true God, Yehovah, and I will not be kept quiet. After her mini sermon, she explained that the Metropolitan Museum of Art was promoting an exhibit on Egyptian art. I set my sights on getting to that museum and it so happened to be the building right behind the obelisk. What are the chances of the museum featuring an exhibit on Egyptian art right behind the Egyptian obelisk? Pretty good, based on what was inside. I tried to go in using my signature one man, one camera shot, but the museum security wasn't going for it this time. So rather than have another run in with the police, I went to the front desk of the museum and asked for a pass to use my tripod. Voila, I got one. It was like deja vu at first. I thought I was inside the Vatican Museum. The Roman and Greek wing was quite impressive. They had a lot of art and an ancient Roman chariot. Good thing it was encased in glass or we would have been taking a ride. I even found a headshot of our friend Constantine, whom the museum promotes by saying, quote, Constantine the Great was the first Christian emperor of Rome, unquote. Did I ever mention that Constantine also removed Egyptian obelisks and set them up in Alexandria and Constantinople? Just checking. I actually came to the museum to see these two guys. The original crab claws that held up our obelisk for approximately 1,880 years before it was brought to Central Park and given new 922 pound crab claws to rest upon. And there was the original Greek and Latin writing to confirm what I had suspected. Quote, in year eight of the reign of Augustus Caesar, Barbarus, prefect of Egypt, erected this monument by the architect Pontius, unquote. As the supports had the shape of a crab, a creature associated in Roman mythology with the worship of Apollo and the sun, they were acceptable to the Egyptians. By the way, I should mention that the crab is the fourth sign of the zodiac called Cancer, and in ancient times, it appeared at the moment of the summer solstice. When Caesar Augustus became ruler of Egypt, he wanted to do things like this obelisk crab act that would appease his new Egyptian subjects and show them his, quote, appreciation and application, unquote, of their religious practices under his rule. The crabs are only a drop in the bucket of how far Augustus was willing to go to meld together the Egyptian and Roman religions. It is time to decide whether this crab deal is a so what or now what moment. If it's a so what moment, then we quickly end this segment, call this episode a waste of time, run the credits and the project is done. However, if it's a now what moment, then we take out our trusty jackhammer and break up the concrete layer of crab crust that has encrusted itself over the information in order to try and hide the truth. Since the privilege is mine, let's get back to work. This entire room where our crabs are displayed is dedicated to displaying the ancient temple Dendor built by Augustus Caesar in Egypt in 13 BC. The actual temple, not a replica, was brought over and reassembled inside the newly built wing of this museum in 1978. Even though I had that feeling in my stomach again, I needed to go inside and take a peek. Augustus Caesar dedicated this temple to Isis, the Egyptian equivalent of the Greek goddess Estar, you know, Easter. There are pictures that tell the story of Egyptian sun god worship on every wall, including Augustus Caesar depicting himself as the new pharaoh in full Egyptian regalia. There is a partial statue of the Egyptian goddess inside the temple, and a fully complete statue of Isis encased outside the temple in the next room. As I was taking as much video as I could to give you the full perspective of the Temple of Dendor, I started wondering again if anyone else other than the Central Park artist and me 
connected these ancient pagan principles to present day practice, or if it was just my imagination. As I left with my questions, I ran into a group of men singing in front of the museum what I was asking in my mind. This building is one of two in the entire world called the Egyptian Building, built as a replica of the Temple of Dendor. One is in South Africa, and this one is in Richmond, Virginia. I bet you can guess what I had to do. I had to see it for myself, just to be sure it was not just my imagination. I started this whole Time Will Tell project in New York City on December 31st, 2011, and now I needed to know if it was just a waste of time and money. So I decided against taking a cab until further notice. I knew there was a cheaper option from Grand Central Station. As I was walking where cabs and cars are supposed to travel, I came across a surprise on top of Grand Central Station of a big clock surrounded by three Greek gods. Mercury, the god of commerce, supported by Minerva, and Hercules representing mental and moral strength. Somebody say, uh-oh. I guess I should mention that this building was built and owned by the Vanderbilt family. I also forgot to mention that Cornelius Vanderbilt paid to have the ancient clock obelisk brought over from Egypt to Central Park that was dedicated by the Masons. This ought to be interesting. Are my eyes deceiving me or is that the Zodiac? Upon closer examination, I noticed that the signs of the Zodiac were not in order but backwards. The Vanderbilts, back when it was painted, claimed, quote, this was the zodiac from God's vantage point, unquote. It seemed to me that their explanation had a hidden meaning. Take a look at the starry hosts that determine our clock and calendar. Be impressed, pay your fare, and get on the train and leave the meaning or mistake to us. Sounded like a good idea to me. I love traveling underground in Manhattan. It just seems like a picture of the process of discovery. You know, beneath the surface. I also like the process of looking for something that would cause people to leave their comfort zones where they could be singer, musician, and producer of their own little fantasy production. I needed something that would shake people at their core in order to get their attention about the importance of God's clock. As I was starting to get a little worried about this potential powder keg of information, I took a page out of this guy's book on how to help people handle a difficult situation. Start out with an attention getter, and then use something that will invite people to join in. choose to ignore you or even become adversarial, well then, let's just say there's a time to address some situations head on and may even call for a little confrontation. So buckle your subway belts and let's keep going. My first stop would be where I call the pulse of New York City, Times Square. Well, I've been full circle. Started on December 31st, 2011, right here in Times Square. Watched the amazing and famous ball drop that changed the calendar from 2011 till 2012. Well, after that, trying to get information, I found myself in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where I was thinking that I was going to do a presentation behind the walls of a studio. That led me to realize that I didn't have answers for sacred time. So what did I do? I did research. I began to dig deep and that said to me I had to go to Israel and from Israel I realized I couldn't get all the information there I had to go to Rome. After Rome I came back to Charlotte, celebrated the Passover right there in Charlotte and now here I am at Times Square again. Why? Because I am convinced in order for people to understand who God is they've got to understand God's clock and so this project is my attempt to help people because I'm here in the midst of what seems like thousands of people that are walking around and just, just being here in the midst of Times Square, but I'm convinced that in the end, they really don't know what time it is, and so what I'm gonna try to do is help them understand just what it means to follow God's plan. You guys say hello to the world right here in the middle of Times Square. We're having a great time trying to figure out what time is it. Do you guys know what time it is? No. No, no idea. No. no idea what time it is, but we know what time it is and we're gonna help them understand it.
The problem I ran into with people was that they were preoccupied with much more trivial matters than the important topic of understanding what time it is according to God's clock versus knowing what time the shops and restaurants are open. It was almost like they were robots programmed to simply find the things that would help them live in fantasy rather than reality. Or even worse, some people's eyes seemed glazed over and they were just walking with the flow of the crowd with no direction. They were overstimulated with images that dulled their minds so that when something important and significant was in their midst, they simply placed it in the same category as the trivial. And there was a perfect example of my point. The Dead Sea Scrolls exhibition right smack in the middle of Times Square. However, most New Yorkers didn't know, or worse, didn't care, that there was a witness of the importance of God's time during the actual week of the biblical holiday of Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was obvious that it was time for people to wake up, and unfortunately, if they didn't hear the alarm clock, they would stay in their state of slumber and allow God's time to pass them by. Just when I needed something to give me direction, I saw this and it clicked. Next stop, you guessed it. If Times Square is the pulse of New York City, then where I was going could be considered the heartbeat of not only New York, but the United States of America and possibly even the world. Rather than proceed directly to Wall Street, I decided to start at the southernmost tip of Manhattan and work my way north, you know, from bottom to top. I really do love the water. The fact that it was a free ride on the Staten Island Ferry made it even more enjoyable and affordable. I thought about going over to the Statue of Liberty to look through the names of immigrants who landed on Ellis Island, but I was sure the ships my family came over on didn't keep records by name and definitely didn't land in New York. As we returned, I noticed a small, quaint-looking building nestled amongst the mammoth skyscrapers. Was that a cross? These tall, shiny buildings were towering over this small brick church. This church was built in honor of Elizabeth Ann Seton, America's first native-born saint of the Catholic Church. Just as I approached the building, bells started ringing, and there was that big hat and keys which reminded me of Pope Gregory and his calendar reform. Here we go again. I walked inside and sat with the congregants as they waited for the afternoon mass. I felt like I was on a treasure hunt and I could hear the familiar voice saying, you're getting warmer. I decided not to stay for the service because it just didn't feel like the answer was here as much as it was a place to start the search. As I walked out, I saw a strange golden sculpture that seemed out of place, so I went to investigate. As I was looking at what seemed to be a damaged piece of art, my eyes were drawn to a large, shiny building that I had seen while on the ferry. I figured that I would have time later to check it out. I started walking toward a corner and my eyes were led toward some yellow spray painting on the sidewalk that had an arrow pointing. And no, I didn't do it. I had come to the beginning of the famous ticker tape parade route called, quote, the Canyon of Heroes, unquote, on Broadway. And guess what was etched in the granite? Pope Gregory's calendar dates. It really was pretty cool reading about these significant times and events in both New York and even American history. Call me a little wacky if you want, but I started walking and singing. Follow the yellow brick road. These dates had my attention. As I was walking, filming, and bumping into people on Broadway, sometimes a date or event would catch my attention and I would slow down and take a second look. It was as if the sidewalk was talking to me. Okay, maybe not talking, just prodding me along the way. I know this bull is the symbol for Wall Street, but I was sensing he represented something different for me on this journey. I was wondering if there was a connection between the dates in the sidewalk and the papal bull of Pope Gregory, the calendar creator, or maybe even something more significant. I just kept walking and taping and bumping into people who probably thought I was just an overzealous tourist instead of a serious writer, director, or cameraman of a new television series. I hoped. It did get a little weird when I came across two strips commemorating not only firemen, but the identical number of 3,000 that participated in the parade. Why the exact number? Maybe it was just a coincidence, like March 22nd, matching the 22 times Major Cooper traveled around the Earth. It was fascinating to see that even God's clock made a cameo appearance on the Canyon of Heroes. Just when I was getting a bit dizzy from looking through the camera and a little embarrassed from bumping into unsuspecting New Yorkers, a name caught my attention that literally stopped me in my tracks, turned me around, and caused me to suspend my entire journey. No more skipping down the yellow brick road for me. The Pope's name in the exact spot would definitely be the Ad Halom thus far moment in this project. Have you ever seen a building that just looks out of place? 
Well, this one has enough historical clout to trump any urban development project. This chapel is the oldest surviving public use building in New York. It survived the great New York City fire of 1776, and on April 30th, 1789, George Washington and his cabinet worshiped here on the day he was inaugurated as the first president of the United States. Like I said, historical clout. The Catholic father led me to one of America's founding fathers, which meant it was back to the dates on the canyon of heroes for me. I heard that George Washington had his own strip on the sidewalk, but in a different place. The problem was the date on the sidewalk didn't match the date of the actual inauguration. Okay, so it's off by one day. What's the big deal? The city wanted to celebrate for two days and decided to make the plaque date line up with their celebration rather than the actual date of the inauguration. That sounds familiar. I had to take a quick detour to go and see the permanent arch that was built in place of a temporary arch that was erected for a centennial celebration that lasted two days back in 1889, April 29th and April 30th. Does this arch look familiar to anyone else? The words of President Washington etched in the stone arch are noteworthy. Quote, the event is in the hand of God, unquote. Something was telling me that George Washington may need some more time during this project. As I was leaving, I noticed that tall, shiny building under construction that my eyes were being drawn to and that kept showing up at strategic places in New York, including this view from Washington's arch. At this point, I started looking for a faster and more convenient form of transportation. Hey, there's no harm in asking. Back to the subway for me. On my way to Federal Hall, where the actual inauguration took place on April 30th, 1789, I came across dates on the opposite side of the street on the Canyon of Heroes. The first one I noticed is for the ticker tape parade of the governor of Rome. And to top it off, it is lined up with the bull that caught my attention from across the street. You know, the bull that represents Wall Street, but reminds me of the papal bull from Pope Gregory, who set the calendar from the Vatican in Rome. Maybe it has an even more important meaning. <laughs> Only time will tell. I wish I could show you all of the dates on the other side of the canyon, but I just don't have time. I've been trying to get to Wall Street. I'd love to see two of anything as a witness for heaven and earth. This was the place I wanted to be. If it's accurate what I said about Times Square being the pulse of New York, then Wall Street is the source of that pulse, and the New York Stock Exchange provides the heartbeat for the financial markets around the world. And at the center of all this activity is Federal Hall, the spot where our President George Washington's inauguration took place. I have to admit, that walking inside this place caused some deja vu. Maybe it was just the architectural similarities with some of Rome's buildings. I still get a little headache when I think about being in some of those temples. I suppose I can't skirt around the fact that George Washington, our first president and one of our country's founding fathers, was a high-ranking member of the Freemasons, the fraternity slash secret society that dedicated the obelisk in Central Park in 1880 that was considered to be part of the Egyptian, quote, astronomical stone clock, unquote. Maybe I should also mention that Robert Livingston, the man who administered Washington's presidential oath, was the first Grand Master of the Grand Masonic Lodge of New York. And the Bible Livingston used to administer the oath of office to President Washington is owned by St. John's Masonic Lodge No. 1 and is still used today when the Grand Master is sworn in and by request when a President of the United States is sworn in. George Bush Sr. used the same Bible and his son, George Bush Jr., requested to use it, but because it was raining during his public inauguration, it was not allowed outside. Reportedly, George Bush Jr. used this exact Bible for his private oath of office inside the White House. After President George Washington placed his hand on this Bible and made his vow before man and God, he and his cabinet members walked down the street toward modern-day Broadway and the Canyon of Heroes. He would have stopped here at the spot of the original Trinity Church for a post-inauguration worship service on April 30th, 1789, but it burned down in the Great Fire of 1776. This third church built on that spot really is an amazing structure filled with historic meaning. I have to say, the clock on the outside caught my attention and encouraged me to at least take a peek inside. It is an impressive place. However, I didn't sense that it was where I needed to spend much time. I did wonder about what it would be like to preach behind a pulpit with an eagle. Maybe there's some hidden meaning, or, or maybe it's just the symbol shared by both Rome and the United States. Who knows? 
our first president walked a short distance past Trinity Church to St. Paul's Chapel, the only surviving place of worship after the devastating fire of 1776. And as I mentioned earlier, it is the oldest continuous use building in New York. Oh, and by the way, it is the place where Pope John Paul II has his name etched in the sidewalk outside. Is there a connection? You know the answer. Only time will tell. I was right back where I was stopped in my tracks in front of St. Paul's Chapel. This time I had both the Pope and the President on my mind. The question was who to deal with first, the political father or the religious father? I decided to delay the decision in order to check out another stone clock in Manhattan. This obelisk was placed here in 1846, well before our authentic obelisk from Egypt stole the spotlight. The obelisk is the second oldest monument set up in New York City, and it was designed by James Goodwin Batterson, who was one of the architects of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., which made me wonder if a trip to D.C. might be in the cards. The oldest monument set up is of George Washington himself. Under this obelisk is the remains of Major Worth, the only man who was publicly buried beneath the streets of New York City. You caught the word publicly, right? I guess I should mention that he was buried with full rites and ritual as a mason and his obelisk was dedicated with the same Masonic ceremony and pagan ritual as our Egyptian obelisk in Central Park. There was that big shiny building in the distance behind the clock that was showing up in significant places and at important times. While I was trying to connect the dots, these guys showed up. Are you kidding me? The building was lining up perfectly with this obelisk. Could it be? It was time to get moving. So I followed the blackbird sitting on top of the grave obelisk. And here is where he led me. These guys didn't seem to mind that I was standing in front of them with a camera. So I just kept filming. I call this true foreshadowing. Just you wait and see. Since it looked like a long walk and I was getting tired, it was time to spend some money. Trains, planes, automobiles, taxi cabs, subways, whatever it will take, we're gonna get you to understand time. <laughs> As I made my way back to the Ad Halon spot on Broadway, I decided to check across the street just to see if there was a date in the sidewalk that would continue to help me connect the dots. Maybe it was the flashing police lights that lined up with the shiny building, St. Paul's Chapel in the Pope's name. But something made me slow down and take a closer look. I come to find out that Pope John Paul II sent Archbishop Anabali Bugnini to the Ayatollah of Iran to request the release of the American hostages. I suppose I should also mention that before Bugnini was in the role of being, quote, papal ambassador, unquote, he was accused of being a Freemason and was stripped of his many influential roles in the Vatican and was banished to Iran. Check it out for yourself. There was one more date on the other side of the street I needed to see with my own two eyes. 
It took some effort to move people away from the food cart in order to get a good shot. But there it was. The only secret society to get presidential and congressional endorsement during Abraham Lincoln's administration and even a ticker tape parade on August 11, 1955. The Knights of Pythias. You gotta wonder how many knights participated in the parade and who they were. For me, it's placement in the sidewalk of the Canyon of Heroes in relationship to the big, tall, shiny building was second only to its organizational requirement to believe in a, quote, supreme being, unquote, whoever that might be. I could smell a rat, but I needed a bit more time and a lot more information before I could catch it. I decided to keep looking for the light at the end of the tunnel, hoping that it wasn't a train, unless, of course, it would run over the rat. I needed to step back and get the big picture before going any further down this road of discovery. So I made my way to the tallest building in Manhattan to get, you know, the power of perspective. How could I be in New York City and not take a tourist break to the top of the Empire State Building? This one-man camera thing wasn't so bad after all. In fact, I was starting to enjoy it. I found out that I could pay some extra money to go to the very top floor. Why not? And then it happened. As I was looking for our odd halom spot, this is what I saw. I know it's just the reflection from the sun on an unknown building, but right in front of my big shiny building? I needed to go back down to the 86th floor to get a clearer view without the window. Just for kicks, I went to the back to see if there was a bright light pointing toward my Egyptian obelisk in Central Park. Instead, I saw people on top of a smaller building that said GE. Maybe I'll have time to check that out later. I went back to the front to film my shiny building in order to get my bearings. And as I was panning back on the street, I noticed a building with a big blue circle with the Masonic symbol. No way. Then I saw what is called the Iron Building that is in front of the Major Worth Blackbird Obelisk I had already visited. It was lined up with the Masonic Symbol Building. Do you remember what I mentioned about Major Worth being a Mason and that his obelisk was dedicated with the same Masonic ceremony as the obelisk in Central Park? After further investigation and some impressive camera work on my part, I noticed that the two buildings made a triangle with my shiny building at its point. I bet you can guess where I wanted to go next. How big of a building do they need for a secret society, or should I say, a society with secrets? The symbol over the door both raised some questions and gave me some confidence. If the Lord is the same Lord as the Methodist Lord, we might have some common ground. There was only one way to find out, and I had to go in to see if I could learn something about these guys who set up the Egyptian stone clock in Central Park and claim our first president, George Washington, as a member. I also wondered if they knew about the triangle I discovered. I found an office with some men talking, so I explained how I had seen their logo from the Empire State Building and mentioned that my grandfather was a Mason. After that, it was time for lights, camera, and action. After meeting the deputy grand master of the very grand lodge that dedicated the Central Park Egyptian obelisk, I was offered a personal tour of the building and a whole lot more. This building is exactly 100 years old. They are two buildings joined together, both of them consists of 19 floors. I'm taking you only up to the 14, because from 14 floor up are the offices, and you would only see the doors. And this is not what you are here for. That's not what I'm here for. <laughs> I think they were under the impression that I was interested in following in my grandfather's footsteps. Let the recruiting visit begin. What I'm going to show you Dear sir, is illustration of the three degrees to become recognized Mason all over the world. He went on to explain that there were rooms in the building designed by a committee formed under the direction of Philip Chavez, who was responsible to match the decor with the Masonic mission. They sit down and discuss how to decorate 12 different large room. He went to the Museum of Modern Art and the Metropolitan, looking for typical example of the Masonic large room. What he did not know, and we Mason knew it, that we have no record what it looked like inside of King Solomon Temple. Wait a minute. He's talking about God's clock headquarters in Jerusalem. 
Now he really had my attention. As my new friend was explaining to me the background of the Masonic movement and boasting about the second largest Masonic library in the world, I was focused on the familiar looking eye over the door. What had I gotten myself into this time? As I was being taught about the first three degrees of Freemasonry, I was already eyeing that locked museum slash library with the passcode activated glass doors. That's been my practice to go to a museum when I begin a new journey. But first I wanted to see these Masonic lodge rooms that supposedly replicate what was inside Solomon's temple. And then I would figure out how to break into the world's second largest Masonic museum. I have to confess that at first I was a little nervous following this guy through big locked doors into even bigger dark rooms, but that was the only way I was going to get to the bottom, or should I say to the top of this secret society's understanding about time. Follow me. Down. I can sit down. Yes, you will sit down. Why I brought you to sit in the most important Masonic large room is when you look at the room from this position, you get much better look of the decor of the room. This is very special Masonic large room and different from any other. What makes it special or different is not the decoration of the room, but the brother Mason who come here. They are nightclub singers, Broadway actors, Philharmonic musicians, opera singers because their job requires of them to work in the evening they have permission to meet during the day after a while it was time for the question and answer session somewhere you have a g inside of the okay wait a second that's the pin okay here's the pin that g means god no. Still, it means geometry. We are not religion, but we are required to believe in something much higher than you or me. We don't care what you call it. If you call it a dollar, which is a joke, or call it what? We know that we are not here out of nothing. Something or somebody or some energy had to create our existence. What are these two columns with the earth and the... Please come with me and I'll explain. These two columns in the King Solomon Temple were at the entrance entering the beautiful room. Anton wanted to talk about everything else except for the signs of the zodiac. As he went on to explain about the other column, I knew I had hit the time jackpot. I did tell you we are not a religion. Now I'm going to break the statement and will talk nothing else than the religious subject. We start with the three great lights in masonry. They represent east, west, and south. We duplicate the King Solomon Temple, and the Grecian of that time believed they worship where the sun comes up and goes down in the west. We always built a Masonic large room facing the east. I am in the actual room where Houdini, son of a rabbi, became a Mason in New York, right here in this room with my friend Anton. He's brought me into the room where Houdini became a Mason. Are you kidding me? Houdini, the great magician. I think my excitement encouraged my friend who had 45 years on his resume as a Mason to keep opening doors for me. As long as he kept turning on the lights, I was willing to follow him from a bit of a distance. 
Though each room had the standard elements of the G, an altar, surrounded by three lights and the two pillars, each room also added a deeper level of meaning through some variation of interior design. The stained glass in the front of this room explained the various tools of Freemasonry and their symbolic meaning. I was caught off guard by the memo I found that refers to the head honcho as the worshipful master. They can't be serious. I am now sitting in the chair of the worshipful master. I just wish my wife could understand this. It would help. <laughs> this room had the colonial motif. And in this one, I got a lesson on Masons and the founding of America. For your information, Masons were the one who created this country free of any foreign occupier. Just when I was ready to declare this whole Mason building nothing more than a 19-story clubhouse with 14 expensive rooms where 5,000 men gather twice a month for make-believe meetings that are probably more like the loyal order of water buffaloes, I noticed this on the floor under the altar. What is this always? It's a sunburst. It's a what? Sunburst. Have you ever been reading a book and thought you had it all figured out and then the next chapter throws you a curve? Well, you got some explaining to do here, Anton. You have to explain this. This, this is Egyptian. And this as a purpose. What we have here are four curtains going all the way from ceiling to the bottom. And they serve for the different diggers. When they close the white right one, and in that little section of the room, they studied the history of Egyptian philosophy. They go to the Roman, Grecian, Western civilization up to the present time. When you get to the last curtain, it makes you seven degree mason. Now, notice the shape of the altar in this room. Could you tell me where is the beginning of it and where is the end? Now that I had found the public relations meaning of the triangle through the branch called Royal Arch Masons, I knew this wasn't a big boys club after all, and this room raised the stakes for those Masons who, as Anton says, quote, want to know what we do and why we do it, unquote. In fact, this room not only had a different shaped altar, but also switched the position of the pillars so that the one called Boaz would be in the south because Judah was the southern kingdom of Israel. He finally took me to a floor that just felt different. Even the routine was halted and the keys stopped working. It was as if Anton became like me and wouldn't let locked doors keep him from getting to where he wanted to be. After trying two more times, he finally got me into what they call the Ionic Room that looked like a government room to me. And on the other end of the hall was what is called the Renaissance Room. This is the most expensive room of the 14 that are within this building, but to be honest, I think that it is a cover for a different name based on what was inside and where it was located. Anton dropped a bomb on me, or maybe I simply tripped over a landmine. Over the G letter is a painting of the Apollo. Wait, can you, oh, wait a minute. All I could say verbally was, uh-oh. What is up there? That's uh, Apollo. Apollo who? Apollo, the god of the Grecian philosophy. All right? But it's not religious, so why is there a god? That was the Grecian philosophy. They had the gods for everything, right? So this was the god of the gods. I got out of there in a hurry and found myself in the hallway with this majestic looking room with two pictures of Franklin and Theodore Roosevelt on the wall. This was not supposed to be on the tour, but my new friend let me in. There he was. Now I knew why this floor felt different and why the government room and what I call the Apollo room were all on the same floor side by side. After seeing this room where the highest ranking Masons meet, I switched into a different mode that motivated me to get an answer that, let's just say, ended my recruiting trip a bit abruptly. 
The last stop of my official recruiting trip was in the room that was used as an exact model for the ballroom of the Titanic. Believe it or not, you are standing in the Titanic ballroom. This seemed like an appropriate place to have what I call a quote, come to Jesus meeting, unquote, with Anton. Last thing, why does it say holiness to the Lord if it's not religious? You can say anything, but you don't discuss religion. Holiness to the Lord. That's amazing. I mean, that's the Lord. But who is the Lord? It doesn't say God. It doesn't say Buddha. It doesn't say the stone. And you worship the stone. You understand? Our question to you would be, if you want to become Mason, do you believe in supreme being? We don't ask you what you call it, what you believe in, but you believe something much higher than you or me. Now you understand that? I do. Have you ever been invited to show yourself out? I wasn't ready to go just yet, and I knew exactly what I needed to see before leaving. This time, I was going solo. You can't expect a guy with a camera inside a building with secrets to leave when he has access to an elevator, do you? I wanted to talk my way into the Masonic Museum slash library with my camera. Have you ever heard the saying, it's easier to apologize than to ask for permission? I've met my, my friend, the librarian. She's going to find something for me. What are you finding for me? Oh, <laughs> a book on the obelisks, right? This is our latest acquisition. It's the proceses from the Vatican on the Knight Templar. It's the what? <laughs> the proceses. And it's all about the trial of the Knight Templar, you know, I guess in the 15th century. But you said it's from the Vatican? The Vatican. They happened to find um, these treasures and they made a book. They made 800 of them. They gave one to the Pope and they sold 799 of them. And we bought one of them. And this is a facsimile of it. It's amazing. So when you have time, it's in English and Italian. You can come someday and we'll take the book over to the table and you could read it if you like. Someday? Now is the time. I am here with a book that was actually in the secret library of the Vatican. I've made it inside the Masonic Lodge in New York. I've been given access to the entire building almost, it seems. I'm in the library, and the librarian has brought the actual book, which has been copied. There are 800 total copies. The first one was given to the Pope. They purchased one here in the library. I have to these special gloves, and I get a chance to read the actual book that had to do with the prosecution of the Knights Templar. The Mason's story of the obelisk that's in Central Park. I am here reading it. I've got the book from the secret archives of the Vatican, information about the obelisk. As the librarian said, I've hit, I've, I'm sorry guys, I've hit the jackpot. <laughs> the more I read, the more the librarian would bring me. After getting a headache from reading about the trials of the Knights Templar, I shifted my focus back to the ancient obelisk slash clock and the New York Masons. Is it a coincidence that the Egyptian clock was dedicated at the Metropolitan Museum of Art on George Washington's birthday? February 22nd was a monumental day and that happened to also be Washington's birthday. I was having so much fun, even the curator of the museum got involved in finding information for me. She had access to everything I needed and seemed more than willing to help me find it in even going to get it for me. While I waited for her to reappear from behind the mirrored doors, I noticed this 33rd degree mason hat had a logo eerily similar to her ring. But I decided not to bite the hand that was feeding me, so it was time to move on. Did you know how many US presidents were masons? When she came out, she had everything I needed. I was in the zone, so I figured there was no harm in asking if I could meet with the director of the library slash museum, who is also a high ranking and obviously quite knowledgeable mason. Oh, and I wanted to use my camera. 
I finally got a chance to discuss the Masonic reckoning of time and the meaning of some symbols. He was more than willing to talk in depth with me as if I was a brother Mason. He opened books and even showed me Masonic time on his documents. Um, this is an appointment I received. And you see it, this comes the, the 9th day of August 2006 mm -hmm. on a Domini, um, 6006 on Lucius. Cool. I was just about to say mission accomplished when I found this. I needed an explanation. Okay. It signifies a word of four letters. And the title given tells us it, it's not a deep interpret because I mean something deeper would say. Mm -hmm. uh, the original Hebrew consists of four letters, okay. which is the more familiar procedure. Okay. So if we go to Jehovah, which is in volume one. probably tell us that it stands for Yadhi Vahi. And the yeah, the entry is quite a bit longer, but is of all of all the significant words of Freemason by far the most important. It's it, did you see what that says? And that's in the This is Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry. I knew it was time for a detour before making my way back to our odd halom spot at St. Paul's Chapel. As far as my visit to the big building with all of the secrets, mission accomplished. It seems that the issue of time and the Tetragrammaton, God's four-letter Hebrew name, were key concepts for our first president and his brother Masons. So it was time for a quick road trip to Washington, D.C. The Catholic father would have to wait.